if you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, a very interesting thing that takes place in 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 deals with uh, uh, the, the beginnings of a rebellion of Moab from Israel. Uh, and it deals with these kings and these leaders, uh, how one of them fell and, and was injured and sought uh, false gods, but also the word of God on his health. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2 is the uh, transition from Elijah, this great prophet of God, to Elisha, his successor. And Elijah's caught up in a, a chariot of fire. Elisha is now the prophet of God to Israel. In 2 Kings chapter 3, uh, it is full-blown rebellion by Moab and these countries going to war. And so in these first three chapters, you have big, international, significant kind of events. And then you come to 2 Kings chapter 4. And beginning in verse number 1, God's word says this, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. It's interesting that we go from all these big events where these kings are named and, and battles take place, and God performs uh, big miracles that all the nations see to this story of one unnamed woman whose unnamed husband dies, and she's left in a difficult situation where her two sons are going to be taken and, and put into captivity because of the debt of their father. And this woman cries out to the man of God. One of the things that I love about this story, and I love about the word of God and, and, and God, is he's not just concerned about big global events. He's not just a God who concerns himself with, with countries and, and, and politics and armies, but he's concerned about individuals. He's concerned about you and me. And that is shown and seen here in 2 Kings chapter 4. As this woman comes to God, or excuse me, comes to Elisha, the man of God, and cries out and says, I am in a desperate situation. This mother in a desperate situation. She cries out to Elisha. Undoubtedly, Elisha must have known this man. She says there in verse number one uh, that uh, he was a, a servant uh, who feared the Lord. The indication here is that he was a, a, a priest or a scribe, but in some kind of uh, ministry type of service. And so Elisha probably knew this man, had had a relationship with him. And so this widow woman feels comfortable enough to come to the man of God and to express her difficult situation. Despite his service, despite uh, what he had done for God, He's in some kind of a debt. And the, the way that that debt would be paid is the servitude of his children, his sons. This was not uncommon. It was a provision that was set forth in the Jewish law. Uh, it wasn't exclusive to the Jewish uh, society at that time. The Romans, uh, as well as others, uh, made it a possibility that the debt would transfer from one generation to the other. And that uh, one of the ways that that could be paid is to, uh, to indenture, if you will, uh, these two sons into service because of the debt of their father. This would have been uh, obviously heartbreaking for this woman who's lost her husband and now would see her two sons go into to, to be servants. Not only that, but financially, it would be devastating to her as well because there was no way for a woman to make her own way in this society, in this economy. She would have been dependent on, the, on first the work of her husband, but then the work of her sons. And now if they're taken as slaves or servants, she's left with nothing. 
She would have, she would have been dependent on, on just the charity of others, maybe even having to, to beg for, for her sustenance while her, her son, or excuse me, her husband was dead and her sons were enslaved. And so it was a desperate and very critical situation. But here's the thing that I want us to see this morning. And that is that God is concerned even on our desperation and our distress. In Psalms chapter 86, beginning in verse number 1, the psalmist expresses it this way. He says, Bow down your ear, O Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am holy. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. See, God wants to answer our requests. God is concerned about our situation. Even when we think that others around us don't see or don't understand or maybe even don't care, God sees, God knows, and God cares for us. He, he wasn't surprised by the situation that this woman was in. And he was already working to provide a remedy for her. Sometimes we can get in situations where we feel like, we just feel like so desperate. You know, I can remember being in, in, in different circumstances, especially early in our married life, some financial difficulties where I just felt like I was drowning. And I thought there was no way out. What in the world were we going to do? How were we going to make it? And yet God sees us, even in those difficult times. Matthew chapter 7, in verse number 7, Jesus said this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks find, finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now I got to thinking about that, kind of meditating on the words of Jesus this week. Jesus said, which of you, being a good father, when your son asks you of something that you have, will not give it to him? I mean, can you imagine your child coming to you and saying, you know, Dad, I am so thirsty. Mom, I'm so thirsty. Could you give me a drink of water? And you're being like, you know, water's really expensive. And I'd have to get up and go all the way to that sink and, and move that lever. I just don't think I'm going to do it. Of course not. Now, maybe if they're 18, you tell them to get it themselves, right? But you certainly don't deny a, a need that your child has. And I thought about on this Mother's Day, moms. You know, I'm the oldest of three boys, and uh, I think when God decides to give to a mom only boys, um, that probably shows some sin that they committed earlier in life. No, I'm just kidding. We've got some moms like that. I'm just kidding. You got to be tough, though, you know? If you're a mom of girls, you got to be tough, too, but in a different way. But uh, growing up, my mom was great. My, we had the house where kids loved to hang out, you know, where popsicles and Kool-Aid and, and uh, later on, you know, cereals and Cokes and Little Debbie snack cakes. Those things were always found. Not for very long, but they were always found. And we had the hangout house. My mom it was great. She is great. She's here this morning, so I'm trying to butter her up. 
So all I got for it was whatever we handed out for church. But I was thinking of you, Mom. My mom was great. I, I mean, she, she was giving to us. She loved us. She cared for us when we were sick. I had a, a great childhood, a tremendous opportunity to grow up in the home that I did. How much more our Heavenly Father? How much more our Heavenly Father? He sees us in our distress. You know, my mom had a way. I mean, I could come home from school and she'd say, how was school? And I would answer like all kids, fine. And my mom could tell whether that fine meant, yeah, pretty fine or really crappy. And she'd want to talk to me about it. And she, why? Because she cared. She cared. How much more our Heavenly Father, God, sees our difficulties and our distresses. He, he's not blind to the struggles that we're in. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 says, You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, and yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask and miss, that you may consume it upon your lust. James says, listen, if we want from God, we need to ask Him. We need to go to Him and tell Him what we, what we need, what our situation is. And that is the example of this mother in, in 2 Kings chapter 4. She goes to the man of God and she cries out and she says, I am in a desperate situation. I need help. I need it right now. What can you do to help me? And Elisha addresses her need. In verse number 2, we see there, Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few, he said. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. See, I see there that Elisha answered the need. He said to her first, what do you have in the house? What do you got? Now, oil was important. Oil was used, uh, there was a type of oil that was used in the lamps that would make light. There was oil that was used in cooking that would be mixed with other things. But, you know, if you just had oil and you didn't have anything else in the house, then what you could do is you could light a lamp and see that you had nothing else. That's about it. Because you can't cook oil with nothing else. If you don't have any meal or flour, oil's not a lot of good. Fried fried isn't real good. You can fry just about anything, but you got to fry something. You with me? That's all she had. But God used what she had. See, I want God to work in, in a miraculous way in my life, but the way I want it, you know? Like, I'd like to be driving down the road with my windows down and a piece of paper fly into my car. And when I look at it, it's a lottery ticket. And I go to the store and get it checked out, and I win millions. Yay! God bless me. But it doesn't seem like God really works that way. In the Bible, God doesn't work that way. You know what he said to, to the widow woman? To that mother of two, two boys? He said, what's in your house? She said, nothing but oil. He said, okay, I can work with that. Jesus did. He saw a whole group of people that had been listening to him all day. They were in a desert place, and they were, they were getting really hungry. And Jesus said, hey, what do we got? 
one boy with an over overprepared mom who packed him a lunch, right? A couple of fishes, a little bit of bread. And you know what the disciple of Christ said? What is this among so many? And Jesus said, I can work with that. I'm reminded of the story in Luke chapter 5. Jesus was speaking there uh, along the seashore. He had gone and stood in a boat just a little ways away because the press of the crowd was so great. And so he's kind of in this boat right on the edge of the water speaking to the people on the land. And when he gets done speaking in verse number 4, he stopped speaking. He said to Simon, Simon Peter, one of his disciples, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So he's in the boat, and he says, he gets done with his message and says, let's go fishing. And I love Peter. This is what, but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Now, who was Peter? He was a fisherman. He had been fishing on these waters probably since he was old enough to walk. His brothers were fishermen. He was a fisherman. He's been up all night. Good message, good message, Jesus. But I don't want to go fishing again. But he says this, nevertheless, we've toiled all night. We haven't caught anything. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. I love that because I think Peter said it like this. Nevertheless. I don't know that. Maybe it was with a lot more faith and gusto than that. But I like to think that Peter was like, really? Really? All right, God. I'll do what you want me to do. I love that. God said, you got a boat and a net, I can work with that. And you know the story. They went out, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners. They started hollering, we need help. The other boat comes over, and both boats are close to sinking from the weight of the fish. What a blessing to these fishermen. I mean, they had worked all night and got nothing. Nothing to show for it, but tired and broke. You ever work that shift? Are you with me? And then they're there listening to Jesus, and, and he gets done fishing, and they're probably thinking, nap. We need some sleep. And Jesus said, Hey, guys, let's go fishing. That was the last thing they wanted to do. Nevertheless. And God blessed them. God uses what we have. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that everything we need, we have. We don't always think about that because we think, you know what, if I had what somebody else had, I'd be okay. If I had the opportunity that somebody else had, if I had the talent or the ability that somebody else had, if I had their brains or I had their connections or whatever, I could, I could do better. But God tells us that everything we need, we already have. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, says this, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that, listen to verse 7, you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Matter of fact, you know what the New Testament tells us? That God uses foolish things to confound the wise. God uses weak things to bring down the strong. So when you're sitting around 
feeling like I've got nothing. I've got no resources. I've got nowhere to turn. You're exactly where God wants you. You're exactly, that's in God's wheelhouse right there. I mean, that's where God does his best work. Because here's a widow woman who's lost her husband, whose two sons are getting ready to be taken away into slavery. All she has is a jug of oil, and God goes, I can work with that. This is where I can make myself known. This is where I can make myself big. Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 28, says this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And he goes on and expounds on that. He says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? To what things? To all that Paul has just said, right? How God has a plan. How God is working things together in our life. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall, he, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Don't skip over that last part. If God loves you enough to send Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die for you, don't you think he loves you enough to help you with the problems and the difficulties you're facing right now? If God would go to such great lengths to send his only son to die for your sins, don't you think he's got something else up his sleeve for the difficulties and the trials you're in now? Are you with me? Do you see what Paul's saying here? God sees us and he desires to intervene. We already have everything that we need. We might not see it, but God does. Because when this widow woman looked at that jug of oil, she thought, there's nothing I can cook with that. And what good does it do to light the lamp and see, I got nothing. But God said, I can work with that. Go borrow some jugs. Go borrow some vessels. And let's start pouring. A couple of things I want you to see as we close this morning. One, I want you to notice the nature of this miracle. The woman and her sons had to act. I mean, Elisha was a part of some awesome miracles. Elisha is one of my favorite characters in all of the Bible. At the end of 2 Kings chapter 2, Elisha is walking, and these, the Bible says that these children came out, and they were mocking the man of God. You know what he did? Called a bear to eat them. That's in the Bible. That I... That is one of my, nobody ever makes that into part of the miniseries, but I want to see that. Because you're like, that is not very merciful. No, but it's pretty effective. You get to the next village, and they're like, Elisha. So they were, they were making fun of him for being bald. He said, Have you met my friend the bear? I mean, Elisha was part of some amazing miracles. There's a place where there was, the water was bitter, and he said, let's take a tree, and they threw it in there, and it was sweet, and it stayed sweet. Elisha, I mean, God could have come to him and said, listen, you know, abracadabra, calakazoom, boom, here's a pile of gold. Could have done that. I mean, he could have done something Big and, 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 but he said, go in your house, shut the door after you borrowed vessels. They had to be active in God's provision. They didn't just sit around and God gave it to them. They were an active participant. Not only that, but the miracle happened when the oil was poured. They had I mean, that was all she had, and she had to risk it by beginning to pour it out. God doesn't 
bless what we hoard and keep for ourselves. Third, the miracle happened behind closed doors. God did a lot of big miracles that the whole country saw, but here God chose, he chose to preserve it in his word, but he chose to show it only to this woman and her sons. But what a family heritage. Don't you think that that widow woman's grandkids heard about that story? I think so. Remember, remember the desperate situation we were in and how God provided? And then finally, the miracle was limited only by her and her son's faith in bar- follow- borrowing the vessels. Elijah, Elisha had told her, right? He said, don't borrow a few. And then let me close with this. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 6. Or excuse me, verse number 7. She fills all these vessels with oil. And then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons live on the rest. She did not presume that the oil was hers to do with what she wanted. She, I mean, can you imagine the joy when she gets done and her son says, that's the last one, and she looks around her house and it's full of jars and jugs and they're full to the top of oil. And she realizes the value that that oil represents. She knows that just a part of that will satisfy the debt that she owes. I mean, I'm thinking there's probably a little bit of of jumping for joy. Not too much, because you don't want to spill the oil. She's a mom of two boys. She probably sends those two boys outside right away. Otherwise, they get to wrestling, somebody will kick over one jug, and all the oil will be destroyed. Amen? Amen? Okay, maybe that was just the house I lived in. Hey, Mom, I, how many jugs do you think I can jump? Zero. <laughs> but they had to be excited, don't you think? I mean, they had to be. I mean, she knew what God had done. But she goes back to the prophet. She doesn't run to the merchant to sell. She understands that what she had before was nothing and what she has now was given to her by God. And she goes back to the prophet. She submits to him. And he said, sell it, pay your debt, keep your sons out of slavery, and then live on the rest. And it gave her some security. It gave her sons an opportunity to establish themselves as as workers, to help provide for their mom. What a blessing that God provided. But the widow woman understood, that mother understood that that miracle that God provided, she needed to submit to God's doing with that. Just like these parents today have dedicated their boys to God, understanding that Children are a blessing that God gives to us, but that we need to give back to Him. It's not just our children. It's everything that we have. And so I want to challenge you in two ways this morning. First, you may identify with that mom this morning. You may be in a difficult and a desperate situation. You may not see any way out. When you look around, the things that you have may seem useless. But can I tell you, God sees your situation too. And he is able to intervene. And everything that you have, everything that you need, you already have. Cry out to him. Ask him to show himself mighty in your situation. Maybe you identify with that woman after she's been blessed. You realize that God has blessed you. Maybe God's done some miraculous things in your life. But are you submitting to him to do 
with those blessings what he desires. Oh, God's not going to bless us to not have us be blessed, but he may have us bless somebody else. How do you think that widow woman was when when another lady went through a similar situation two, three years later? Oh, what a testimony she had. Matter of fact, I like to think that the people around her probably got sick of hearing the oil story. You know? You ever know somebody like that? They go to tell you a story. I am somebody like that. There is no story my children haven't heard multiple times. My poor wife's heard them all many times. But what a testimony. And so I want to challenge you. If you're in difficult and desperate situation, call out to God. Ask Him to make Himself known and real in your life. He desires to do that. And then, look for an opportunity this week to be a blessing to somebody else. Maybe God will use you to do His work in the lives of somebody else this week. Let's pray.